first let me say, any questions from your reading? Are you enjoying the, you know, the Alistair McGrath and the, the Ravi Zacharias and uh, etc.? You, you think those are hard. I could recommend some to you. Um, no, I mean, it's hard to read. I don't like seeing anything to read. Okay. So I'm going to get into some of those things, uh, some of those things today because our topic today is science and origins. The issue, last time we met, we talked about faith and reason. The question of whether or not having religious belief at all, and Christianity as a belief in particular, whether that is reasonable, you know, whether or whether, as Dawkins and the other new atheists insist, that it's irrational and unjustifiable and that you have to be, as Dawkins has said, um, insane. You have to be crazy. You have to be mentally ill to have a religious belief. Um, and I think the sort of summing up what we said two weeks ago was when they say that faith is irrational, the way they define faith is not an accurate definition. What they're talking about is blind faith, faith that is not based upon any evidence or exper legitimate experience or anything else, that it's just, you know, a wild shot in the dark. That's what historically has been known as blind faith. That's not the same thing as faith that is based upon testimony or evidence, which is what we believe our faith is. On the other hand, they insist they have no faith at all, that they are not dependent upon faith. And in fact, the whole scientific endeavor, and most of the new atheists are scientists, probably the only major exception of that was Christopher Hitchens, who was a journalist. He died in 2011, or 2012, 11 or 12. And I think it was December 2011. And he, um, but most of them are scientists. And so the very fact that you pursue scientific endeavor requires first that you have faith, if you will, believe, the right definition, you have some belief in, the fact that the world is knowable and that it is in some way predictable and can be analyzed. And secondly, you have to have faith, that is belief, that whatever you find is in some way, um, be, you can access it and interpret it and it's useful to you. So there is very much how they define faith and apply, try to apply to all belief, Christian, Christians and other religious people is an illegitimate and sort of just a made up for their purposes definition of faith. And when they insist they don't have faith, if they didn't, they couldn't pursue science. And most scientists who don't have an ax to grind will admit that faith is an inherent part of what they have to do. If you understand faith to mean a belief in something, you have to have sufficient belief to at least pursue it. To have, you know, I believe this is true. You can't say that because belief and faith are synonymous with one another according to the Oxford English Dictionary. So that's what we talked about last week. Because many of these, most, almost all, of these new atheists are scientists, a few are mathematicians, but they perceive math as being a, a, an element of science, which is, it is, it's a genre of science, then they insist that science effectively and completely dispenses with any religion, with any religious belief. And so, today we're going to talk about that. Science and origins, particularly, is science truly successful in getting rid of God, getting rid of religious faith? Is it true that science and religious belief of any kind, especially Christianity, are totally incompatible? That you can do good science and also be a person of faith? Now, the reason Christianity comes up most often is that most of these people are from the Western world, where Christianity is the dominant religion. They're from England, they're from the United States, they're from Australia. And so you don't get, um, you neither get a whole lot of scientists, nor do you get a whole lot of atheists coming out of, uh, at least scientific atheists, coming out of Albania, or you know, somewhere else, or Saudi Arabia. There have been a couple, but not many. They're not the major ones. So when they talk about religious faith, just given their context, they're almost always specifically shooting at Christianity. And so we're going to be talking about that today in terms of the relationship between science and particularly the science of origins, where did things come from, and why, why is that the issue, we'll get into that, versus religious belief of any kind, and most especially Christian. Every week I'm starting with this because this is our mandate, this is why we're doing this. 1 Peter 3.15, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. We're told to be ready to tell people what we believe and why. But do this with gentleness and respect, two characteristics that the new atheists do not have. You know, they are, even other atheists don't want to have anything to do with them because they are so aggressive and so mean-spirited about everything they do. If you read any of Dawkins or even worse, Sam Harris, 
Daniel Dennett is a little more neutral. Christopher Hitchens was, was really inflammatory, although he was in kind of a flamboyant, you know, controversialist kind of way. You can almost enjoy it a little bit. But some of these people, like Sam Harris, there's no way to enjoy it. He's just mean, you know, and, and is always trying to poke you in the eye. And so it's very difficult. We are not called to that. We're called to have gentleness and respect when we are declaring what we believe as opposed to those who are aggressively against our faith. Keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be, be ashamed of their slander. And the quote from R.C. Sproul that I really like, defense of the faith is not a luxury or intellectual vanity. It is a task appointed by God that you should be able to give a reason for the hope that is in you as you bear witness before the world. We're told to do this. The reason, you know, we've had a class in apologetics before, and people frequently are asking questions about that. I'm going to use, if I get that far today, I'm going to use two or three slides that came from that class, where we talk about um, reasons for the existence of God, why we believe in the existence of God, and some of them are scientific in their orientation. But I have a class on the sort of looking at apologetics from a positive point of view. This class particularly is oriented toward responding to the new atheists because they are the most vociferous, they are the ones that are getting major publishing deals and selling millions of copies of books. Dawkins says the God delusion has sold 31 million copies. It's in 31 languages and it's sold millions of copies. I don't know how many it is now. The number I saw was quite old, but at that point even it was translated into 31 languages. And these are major publishing houses that are putting these books out there on the New York Times bestseller list. They are at least the most audible voice against our faith or any faith that exists today. And that's why I thought it was justified for us to have a class where we specifically talk about that, okay? Because we're told to do that. We're told to be prepared to respond to those who would be against our faith or those who simply don't have faith and we can explain why we believe. Okay, so science versus religion. Most Americans believe in God. And I'm, I'm using Americans simply because you have to pick some place to have a statistic for it. Most Americans believe in God. It's been estimated that 92 or 93 percent say they believe in God. Um, like 82 percent, I think it is the latest number, would identify themselves as Christian specifically. Um, uh, considerably fewer, although some, would hold to a naturalistic Darwinian view of life. Naturalistic means the natural world is all there is. There is no supernatural. There is no God. There is no Holy Spirit. There are no angels. There is no soul. Naturalistic and materialistic, for all, all intents and purposes, are synonymous words. Naturalistic means the natural world. Materialistic means believe only in the material world. It doesn't mean all at once money. From a science or a uh, philosophy point of view, when you say materialism, you don't mean, you know, um, I'm a material girl. What you mean is I believe only in the physical material world. Um, but Darwinians... Those who are particularly skeptics or even atheists who hold to the Darwinian uh, belief in origins would insist that they're the only ones that got it right. In fact, they would come in one day, you can sit up here. Well, we have four of us. Well, okay, there's four chairs. Maybe get Mike scoot over one. Um, Darwin, the Dar Darwinism, they would say, now these are the claims of the, the Darwinian scientists who are uh, atheists or skeptical. They would say, one, that Darwinism is scientifically established beyond any reasonable doubt. Which I do not believe is true. We're going to talk about that. Secondly, they would say that any challenges, they do say, not would say, they do say that any challenges to Darwinism are religiously based and are therefore unscientific and irrational. Embedded in that is the assumption that any, any other science other than Darwinism is irrational unscientific and inherently religiously based. There are no other options. It's either Darwin or it's stupid time. Okay? Third, any challenge to Darwinism in the public square violates the constitutional separation of church and state and must be legally opposed lest we turn, it, turn into a theocracy. This is the argument that is usually presented whenever there have been efforts to try to introduce intelligent design, not as the only, but as an alternative in public schools. The ACLU and a lot of others have, have gone to court over and over and over again to try to prevent anything other than evolution by natural selection, that is Darwinian evolution by natural selection. And if you're not sure what that is, I'm going to talk about it in a minute. 
to prevent any other idea than that from being presented in public schools. And they claim that if you have any other idea, is that it, it is inherently religious and therefore a violation of church and state. There is no room in the, the thinking of Darwinists in our, in our country being the United States, excuse me that not everybody here is American, but in the West, I will say, that there is some alternative that perhaps is not religiously motivated, that is legitimate science, that is not irrational, but does not agree with Darwinism. There isn't room for that in the thinking of most of the Darwinian scientists, atheists and skeptics. Okay? And then they would maintain that the scientific establishment is an open marketplace of ideas with little or no bias. They're just following the evidence, unlike those dumb religious people. They're following the evidence, and this is where it takes them. And anybody who doesn't see that's just crazy. Well, I'm going to give you some quotes today that knocks that in the head, big time, from eminent scientists who are Darwinians and atheists. Okay? So, I believe all four of those statements are false. And yet, this is what, despite the fact that the majority of Westerners would maintain some sort of religious belief, the majority being Christian, because that's the dominant religion in the world, uh, most people would say they believe there is a God. And yet, the Darwinians who represent, you know, they, not all, by long shot, not all, but they have a heavy uh, presence in the scientific community, which is, you know, our culture is very science-oriented. We, we suffer from scientism. A lot of people would say they believe in God, but then they would say, oh, science is the best way to find truth because we've gotten addicted to science as the only source of truth, which is one of, one of the problems behind this. So there's sort of a conflict. They haven't, people haven't worked that out. But the Darwinians would say, you know, anybody who doesn't agree with us is just dumb, even though most people don't when you ask them if they believe in God, right? Are we... We're good so far? You understand where we're going with that? Now, why is this a deal for us? Um, it really is an issue of, I, you know, I'm not an evolutionary biologist. I, I don't claim to be. I love sciences. I've been involved in science. I actually was going to be a doctor, and then I decided everything else I could have studied was too much fun, and I didn't want to spend all my time in pre-med and med, so I went into communication kind of stuff, uh, arts and literature and photography and all that kind of stuff. Well, the fact is, if Darwinism is true, and if you're not sure what Darwinism means, I will talk about that, it is much less likely that Christianity is true. If Darwin was right, or at least if Neo-Darwinism, which is the modern you know, incarnation of the Darwinian belief of uh, natural selection, of uh, descent, then Christianity is pretty unlikely. This is why the people that hold to a, a very a strong kind of overwhelming belief in Darwinism, have a tendency to reject religion, and particularly Christianity, because those two things, to a great extent, are mutually incompatible. The reason is because, uh, it, well, and Darwinism is foundational to the secular worldview that wants to marginalize religious faith as having no claim on knowledge. Religion, nothing but science can give you any knowledge that's legitimate. Richard Dawkins very famously said, Darwinism allows one to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. It meets all my needs. I don't need religion because Darwinism is the, it answers all my questions, gives me everything I need. In fact, Dawkins, who had grown up with some connection to the church at least, when he was very, like 16 years old, was introduced to the theory of evolution, Darwinianism, and decided he didn't believe in God anymore. That was the, the turning point for him. So Darwinism gives strength to atheism. Skeptics and atheists have long employed Darwinism as a defeater of Christianity and theism. Theism being a belief in a god, whether it's the Christian god or a Hindu god or something else. Theism just means you believe there is a god, at least one. They claim that undirected evolution, that is, they didn't have to be a designer, they didn't have to be a, an omnipotent being mush, moving it along, that undirected evolution replaces design, that every aspect of the development of the species and of the human body can be explained by operations of nature, of natural selection, and the background conditions of the universe. So the point is, Darwinism is more than just biological theory. This isn't just science. It has become the foundational plank supporting an anti-God worldview, a completely secular worldview. As Dawkins says, and as many others believe, once you accept Darwinism as being true, you don't need a God anymore. All the sense of origin and design, all of that stuff is explained, although I, I insist not adequately. 
I'm, I'm quoting them now. They would say everything you need in terms of the origins of the universe, of living beings, and particularly of humanity, is all explained by evolution. So we don't need God. God has been made redundant by modern Darwinism. And it has become the foundational plank under all sort of skeptical, cynical, Western intellectual tradition. Not to say that all intellectuals are skeptical and, and cynical, but you know there is a trend that way. Um, too smart to need God anymore, basically. All right. Give you a couple of quotes. These are quotes that were taken from atheists that were uh, that appeared on national public radio. Fundamentalists, and they would call anybody that doesn't that that believes in God, they would call a fundamentalist. <coughs> they sort of dismiss them with that. Okay. Fundamentalists are attempting to inject religion into the science curriculum again by censoring Darwinism in the public schools. Even the one they say that about the ones, even though they're not trying to say you can't teach Darwinism, but you need to give kids and you know children in school an alternative. There is another way of looking at this. But they insist that when you do that, you're trying to get rid of, you know, Darwin, uh, Darwinian evolution. This denial of church-state separation is being challenged by the ACLU. Parents and children have the right to believe whatever they want religiously, but the teaching of science leaves no room for personal and religious beliefs to be taught in the public classroom. So science is value-free. It's, you know, proven. The Darwinian evolution, that's what you, but the idea that there might be some other explanation is violation of church and state, it's religious, it's irrational, it's inappropriate to have that in schools. Hear that? Another quote, if the creationists had scientific evidence for their position, they could have made their case in the professional peer-reviewed journals, which are the testing ground of theories. But they've not done so, therefore they have no claim on being scientific. That is not true. Yes? Has Darwinianism done triple, I mean, like double blind, placebo controlled studies that could be put in a scientific journal? Well, they, you can't, you can't <laughs> test Darwinian, you know, there, it's not like you can run an experiment to demonstrate that. But is that creationist? Well, the peer reviewed, peer reviewed journals, they're saying that people who have, who have taken their particular area of expertise, molecular biology or whatever else, and they would say that we have experts who are Darwinian. Uh, in their, that write these documents and they, they support it by their studies. Mm -hmm. But they won't even consider studies by others. And I'm going to get to whether or not that's true, that you know, the, there's no scientific claims in support of that. Um, so they write, they write academic articles, they do get them published, but they don't acknowledge the fact that the same thing is true of, of non-Darwinian science. And it, it's not true that all non-Darwinians are religious. Um, in fact, let me, I'm going to jump ahead and give this to you, um, and I'll come back to the one I just skipped. While the Darwinists reject all, all criticisms of Darwinism as religiously based, unscientific, and unworthy of serious attention, and that's, those aren't my words, I mean they really do, they say that it is false, uh, but we would say it is false that all significant critiques of Darwinism come from religious sources. That's simply not true. There are scientists who are non-religious. In fact, I'll give you a book called The Atheist Delusion by David Berlinski. Really good book. Berlinski identifies himself in the preface as not being a person of faith. He is a secular Jew and not a religious person. But his whole book is about how the whole atheist argument, much of it founded on Darwinism, simply does not wash. So there's a good example of somebody who's very well known and popularly read who is not a religious person who says Darwinism doesn't make sense. David Berlinski, B-E-R-L-I-N-S-K-I, The Atheist Delusion. Now, in recent years, it, it, you need to know too that from the very first uh, publication of The Origin of the Species, there were people of science who were really disagreeing with, with Darwin from the very start, and there always have been. In recent years, a variety of thinkers, many different thinkers, well-known people of intellect, have challenged Darwinism without any religious references. Mortimer Adler, you may know of the philosopher, um, the Harvard-trained lawyer Norman Macbeth, British novelist and science writer um, Arthur Kessler, the social critic and science writer Jeremy Rifkin, British science writers Francis Hitchens, not, don't mis mistake that with uh, uh, Christopher Hitchens, uh, I'm sorry, Francis Hitching, Gordon Rattray Taylor, uh, Richard Melton, um, Australian geneticist Michael Denton. These are not people of religious belief. They are philosophers, mathematicians, scientists. 
who basically are saying there's something wrong with this theory. It does not work. In fact, since 2001, there have been, at this point, about 900 scientists of various worldviews that have signed a public statement questioning legitimacy of Darwinism. The statement that they agree to, and, and frequently the question is asked, does this mean you're all religious? And they go, no, we're not saying anything beyond this statement, and this is what it is, the statement. We are skeptical of claims for the ability of random mutation and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. Careful examination of the evidence for Darwinian theory should be encouraged. 900 major scientists. These are professors at major institutions, at Cambridge, at Oxford, um, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and on and on and on. And if you want to check that, give you a website. You can either do a search for scientific dissent from Darwinism, or the website is www.dissentfromdarwin, D-I-S-S-E-N-T-F-R-O-M-D-A-R-W-I-N.org. They not only have a lot of background and frequently asked questions, but they have um, 13 pages in a PDF of the scientists and their credentials who have signed that they agree with that statement, that Darwinism simply does not seem to work, and they think it needs to be questioned. All right? So this idea that only religious, irrational people who have no evidence and cannot present anything are, in, are against Darwinism is hooey. It's, it's public, you know, it's propaganda. It really is. So much of the stuff is propaganda. And you can go to that website and see the specific people and their very significant credentials who disagree with Darwinism. All right? Now, I'm going to go back to the previous one. Belief in Darwinism as a comprehensive explanation for the biosphere has become a deterrent to the Christian faith. How many young people go off to college and the first time they're presented in a science class with the alternative to any sort of religious belief, which is evolution by natural selection as first presented by Darwin and then developed by the neo-Darwinists and now presented by the Daniel Dennett's and the, the, the Richard Dawkins of the world. The entrenched Darwinian ideology is an obstacle to the discussion and teaching of God's intervention in creating life and setting humans apart in nature. If you were in our ethics class yesterday, you heard us talk about the fact that one of the atheists, and he's listed among new atheists, named Peter Singer, um, he is a, a sociologist and a consequentialist eth um, ethics professor. He carries, I at least give him credit for this, he carries Darwinian atheism to its logical conclusion, which is to say human beings are nothing more than any other living creature. We are just a collection of molecules in motion. For that reason, Singer, again, he draws it to its reasonable conclusion, Human beings are no more valuable than any other sentient being. That if you had to choose between killing one person or killing ten cows, you should kill the person because it's a ten to one ratio. And cows are sentient creatures just as important as people. Um, in fact, any living organism, he would say. And for that reason, he is a huge advocate, I mean, published extensively, that he believes suicide and euthanasia are good ideas. And I also quoted yesterday in the ethics class, on the issue of euthanasia, and again, this is, this is where this kind of thinking takes you. What, parts of Western Europe, including the Netherlands especially, are significantly atheistic. I mean, they, there's very little religious uh, focus there. In the Netherlands in 1984, they passed a law legalizing euthanasia at the discretion of the doctor. The Hague, the International Tribunal in The Hague, not too long ago published a report that said that euthanasia in the Netherlands had rung amok that since 1995, 3% of all fatalities in the Netherlands were from people being euthanized. And at least 20% of those were involuntary, meaning the doctor legally has a right to kill somebody without even asking them. <laughs> all right? That's the logical conclusion if we do not have any sense that human beings are anything more than any other kind of animal. That's where that takes us, folks. And so whenever we say that you know, humanity and, and all living things and the universe was created without any divine intervention and that human beings are nothing more than one more biological entity in the world, that's where we go with that. That's the logical conclusion that we will come to. I mean, think about that. 
Um, the establishment, de facto establishment of naturalism in science, remember there's no, nothing supernatural, no God, no spirits, no angels, no souls. The naturalism in science and culture at large has a vice grip on public discourse. In other words, that's those quotes I just gave you on the fact that it's very suggestion that there should be some other consideration of the science of intelligent design in the schools creates this, you know, avalanche of vitriolic kind of criticism. Darwinism suffers from fatal flaws both logically and evidentially. It is far less well supported than commonly thought. It thus opens a door for Christian apologetics that would be otherwise closed. Now, the idea that it's not as well supported as commonly thought, or as the propaganda says, is why pe people are not often aware that 900 or so scientists have signed that are not religious. Some of them, I'm sure, would be. You know, they would be people like John Polkinghorne, who is a physicist of significant repute in, in Britain. He was a professor at uh, Cambridge and resigned, sort of retired from that in order to go to seminary and become a rector at an Anglican church in England. Uh, or the various other people. Um, um, Francis Collins, the director of the Human Genome Project, considered the most ambitious and successful scientific effort in the history of humanity. They mapped the whole human genome, and he is a Christian. Uh, yes, Rudy. Uh, do you know what percentage of these 900 are either Christian or Jews? No, I don't. In fact, that's that's you could probably look them up one at a time, but they make a specific point of saying of not having that information on there because they don't want to give ammo. These are just scientists, and they are credible, credentialed scientists. Whether they have any religious faith or not, part of the point they're trying to make is this is not a religious question. Darwinism, neo-Darwinism, is bad science. And here are 900 of us, legitimate scientists, apart from any religious belief that some of them may have, who say, you need to think about this again because this, this does not seem right to us. All right? Questions about that? Let me read you, in fact, I've got here a, a, a little section from the Scientific Descent from Darwin, Darwinism website. It reads, during recent decades, new scientific evidence from many scientific disciplines, you notice scientific evidence from various scientific disciplines, such as cosmology, physics, biology, artificial intelligence research, and others, have caused scientists be to begin questioning Darwinism's central tenet of natural selection and studying the evidence supporting it in greater detail. Yet public TV programs, educational policy statements, and science textbooks have asserted that Darwin's theory of evolution fully explains the complexity of living things. These are scientists saying this. The public has been assured that all known evidence supports Darwinism and that virtually every scientist in the world believes the theory to be true. The scientists on this list, about 900 of them, dispute the first claim and stand as a living testimony in contradiction to the second. In fact, those claims are that uh, one, everybody agrees with Darwinism, you know, secondly, there aren't any scientists that, that uh, don't agree with Darwinism. Since Discovery Institute launched this list in 2001, hundreds of scientists have courageously stepped forward to sign their names. And realize that scientists often, when they sign this, they come under huge pressure from the academic institutions where they work, from colleagues who say, you know, you really are an idiot, and we thought you were a good guy. It goes on, the list is growing and includes scientists from the United States Academy, National Academy of Scientists, from Russian, Hungarian, and Czech national academies, as well as from universities such as Yale, Princeton, Stanford, MIT, UC Berkeley, UCLA, and others. Darwinism is not the only way. A lot of very credible people, whether religious or not, do not believe it anymore, and yet the propaganda says this is the only right way to go, and it's the only thing that we should be considering in schools and elsewhere. Okay. Questions about that? Yes, John. Um, if they're so certain, I'm not talking about the I'm talking about the people that they're confronted with. They're so certain that the theory of evolution is irrefutable. Why do they still call it a theory of evolution? They don't. Not the law of they evolution? don't. I've never heard it called the law. Oh, well, they just say uh, evolution by natural selection or Darwinian evolution. They don't use the theory word anymore. They will say things like, uh, and Dawkins, in fact, in an interview, um, said, 
We are as sure of evolution by natural selection as we are sure of anything in science. That's a quote. Theodore Dobansky, who is a bi this is biologist. The, this is the same guy that's not a scientist. No, it is a scientist. Richard <laughs> Dawkins. Richard Dawkins. The one that wasn't a scientist was Christopher Hitchens. He died. Dawkins is a scientist. A scientist of some, of some repute. Um, so Daw you know, Dawkins wrote the Selfish Gene. He, you know, he is considered to have come up with the latest and best idea about how genes are involved in the evolutionary process. Um, you get people like the Theodore Dobansky, who was a world famous biologist. He's dead now, and he said, "If evolution is wrong, nothing else is certain." I mean, that's how strongly they feel about it. They don't call it the theory anymore. Um, they believe that they have enough evidence that they think it's conclusive. I don't agree. A lot of people don't agree. 900 scientists who signed this don't agree. Right? So, if we don't agree, we don't believe that, we being Christians, what do we believe? Before I get into what Darwinism says, I want to talk about how Christians talk about the origin of the universe, well, particularly about the origin of life and the origin of human life. I'm not going to get into the Big Bang Theory today, although I believe the Big Bang Theory did happen. I believe the Big Bang did happen, and I believe it's a beautiful, a beautiful reality that is described by, in the beginning, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Right? I think the Big Bang is a great explanation for how God created. But I'm going to talk about there are three major models within Christian ideas. That purport or that that propose how creation happened. Yes, there are people that believe in God, believe in Jesus Christ, that sort of have both feet have have their feet in both camps. You know, I I believe God created the earth, and these theories, including Darwinism, shows us some have a theory on how he went about. You know, right. the whole thing. What you're describing is the first one I want to talk about. It's okay. called theistic evolution. No, no. Good setup. I couldn't have paid you for that. Uh, or I could have paid you for that. Theistic evolution is the first of the three theories I want to talk about that Christians propose as to how, believing that there's a God, how did God create? How did, how, what was the process? Theistic evolution says that God created the universe. He made it all, and then he stepped back, and he let the inherent properties of the universe create life, and subsequent species, but he didn't have any direct involvement as a designing intelligence. This is sometimes referred to in the Latin as Deus ex machina, God in the machine. God made it, he set up all the natural laws that exist, and then he turned it loose, and everything that happened after that, you know, from the raw materials, the, the idea that there was, there were chemical pools, and that amino acids were formed, and from those amino acids, proteins became, and from proteins, single-celled, Animals and from single adult animals, you know, more complex animals ultimately, a lizard that crawled out of that, and later on the lizard became a bird, and mammals developed, you know, and on and on. But they believe that all of that happened as a natural sequence without God specifically being involved. All he did was make all the stuff originally. Because of that, a lot of theistic evolutionists would agree with Darwinism. They would say Darwinism kicked in. Darwinism is a theory that explains what happened. The process after God made all the stuff. Okay, um, there are some pretty serious problems with theistic evolution. I don't believe it's right, and I'll tell you why I don't believe it's right. Because, for one thing, Genesis, the Genesis account, and I'm making an assumption here. As Christians, particularly evangelical Christians, as I am, and I know some of you are. Um, I hope all of you are. I don't know. We believe that the Bible has veracity to it. Now, sometimes it's difficult to know how you interpret it, okay? And I'm going to get in, when I talk about the progressive or day-age creationism, the third kind, I'll give you an example of that. But we believe that it is, uh, that it's true. Well, Genesis, the first two chapters of Genesis are very clear in saying that God didn't just create and then wander off. And he didn't just make the stuff and then wander <coughs> off. That he was actively involved in each of the phases, the creating of the animals that live on the, on the earth, the creating of the animals that live in the sea, you know, the creating of the birds of the air, and on and on. Each of these, God specifically was involved in, in designing that. And that when it came to humanity, 
God had a particular plan. Let us make man in our own image. Male and female, he created them, it says. So he was very specific about what he wanted to do according to the Bible. Theistic evolution throws all that out. It says God didn't do any of that. All God did was basically cause all of the raw materials to come together, and then the rest of it just sort of happened by chance. And Darwin was right. Okay. So the basic way that God is presented, it seems to me to be fundamentally flawed in theistic evolution. It is, it is not only not consistent with Scripture, but it is contradictory to Scripture. In addition to that, um, the suggestion that God would have created a universe, not been involved in it, in terms of the specifics, but only the, gen, you know, the initial general stuff, and then left no evidence of his fingerprint on anything. Because if humanity really did just develop from lower forms of life, which the theistic evolutionists would agree with the Darwinians on that, then we're not made in the image of God. We just sort of, you know, one day an ape was born and he looked a lot like us. Okay? The theistic evolutionists would agree with that. Michael Denton says this with regard to theistic evolution. As far as Christianity was concerned, the advent of the theory of evolution and the elimination of traditional teleological thinking was catastrophic. Teleological thinking there means that God had a plan. There was a goal that God was going to accomplish. Not just that he put all this stuff out there and then whatever's going to happen is going to happen, which is what theistic evolution basically says. The suggestion that life and man are the result of chance is incompatible with the biblical assertion of there being a direct result of intelligent, created activity. I believe the idea that evolution, Darwinian evolution, is right, that God made all of the raw materials and then all of it just sort of happened according to what Darwin said and natural selection came along, etc., is not at all consistent with the description of who God is, of the creation process, of who human beings are. It completely severs us in any meaningful way, severs creation from a God who had intent, a teleological intent, an end result in mind. You see what I'm saying? So while this is fairly common, and I think it's fairly common because people who aren't willing, on the one hand, they're not willing to give up the idea of God, and on the other hand, they're not willing to Either they don't have enough information or enough intestinal fortitude to disagree with the popular idea that evolution, Darwinian evolution is true. They don't want to give up either one of those. And so theistic evolution is an attempt to try to give everybody, you know, say everybody's right. And I don't think it's true. Yes? Who part of the Christians believe in that? Well, I, I can't give you particular names, but I know people that would say that. That they believe in evolution, they believe Darwin is right. Or or well, they would claim to be Christian. Um, that, yeah, they believe in God and they believe in Jesus, but they thought that everything just sort of... that God, And they would say, well, God set it up. God sort of intended it. He set it up so that all the pieces were there that needed to come together, but it came together by accident. That's not what Scripture says. The Bible says that God was very intentional at every step along the way. And that the description of God and the, the theistic evolutionists and the description of the value of humanity as being made in the image of God don't hold, according to that theory. So I don't buy that, and most evangelicals don't. That's much more of a liberal, um, a liberal Christian kind of idea. Okay, any questions about that? The second view, which gets a lot of press, is scientific creationism. To their credit, before I say anything negative, scientific creationists are the ones that have taken the most responsibility for calling Darwinism into question. They're the ones that usually are quoted in the magazines or the newspaper articles, they're the ones that write this stuff against. So they're the most actively in opposition as Christians. But they basically are saying that God created the universe and all life in six 24-hour days, not more than 10,000 years ago. This is young life scientific creationism, um, which is young life, the, the young earth or, and young universe idea is, by definition, what scientific creationism is. If they don't believe in the young earth, then That'll get us to the third kind. So they insist that contrary to all evidence about the age of the universe, you know, the, the, there is enormous scientific evidence, verified by Christian scientists as well, that the world, the universe, is not less than 10,000 years old. There is significant evidence that the world, the, well, the universe, is between 13 and 15 billion years old. And... You know, we have dinosaurs, etc. And, and when you say to somebody who believes that the world is not more than 10,000 years old, well, what about dinosaur bones? 
I actually had somebody tell me once, here in Ahihi, well, you know, God, when he created the, the, the earth, he put those dinosaur bones there. And so that it, you know, they were there for us to find. And, and the dinosaurs never really lived. And I'm going, why would he do that? Is he trying to mess us up? Is he trying to mislead us? What possible motivation could he have for doing that? And yet that's what young earth creations, that's how they explain the evidence of, uh, of archaeology than paleontologists, that the, all of the ancient bones and all of that stuff is simply, God put them there for us to find, and they don't really have an explanation for why. And to me, that makes no sense. I mean, to most, I think most people, that doesn't make any sense. I see the looks on your faces, that doesn't seem to make sense to you either. But that's the argument they make. Now, and this is very popular, and there is a, you know, a, um, oh, what's it called? A creation museum in Petersburg, Kentucky, there is the Center for Creation Research. There's a lot of effort going into this. But the problem is, we believe that God made everything. You know, God gave us his word, the word of God. God also created the world. God created everything that he is. It's all his. He is the source of all of that. And so I think we have to take into account what's sometimes been called the book of, um, of scripture and the book of nature. Francis Bacon, great scientist, philosopher, Francis Bacon referred to those as the book of God's words and the book of God's works. And there is some way that those things are compatible. And the problem with creation, uh, with scientific creationism is, they emphasize the word to the, to the ex in a literal, very literal sense, to the extent that they, they either completely discount or they have to find very difficult excuses, like God put the bones there, but we don't know why to try to explain what science, legitimate, even Christian scientists have found as being evidence for the, for the universe being 13 to 15 billion years old and there having been dinosaurs that lived on the earth. You know, one of the early ideas, I don't think they pushed this anymore behind creation, um, you know, scientific creationism, was that species, you know, that the idea that what God made would never completely die out and so the dinosaurs didn't go extinct because God's creations would not have gone extinct. Well, we, you know, Every week we have a, a species going extinct now, and they never, so they stopped talking about that. But they used to say extinction was not possible given the fact that God had, had intention behind making every creature. And so therefore the dinosaurs weren't real. And the oil? And oil, where's oil come from? Exactly, how long does it take for that, you know? Well, and, and, and there are other things, there are cosmological questions, like we, given the speed of light and given how far away stars are, and how long it takes light to get here, when you look up and you see a star that is tens of thousands of light years, hundreds of thousands of light years away in some cases, it's taken 100,000 years for the light from that star to get there where you can see it. How is that? Well, the scientific creationists would say, well, God put the light in the sky not so far away from you so that in less than 10,000 years it arrived here. Do you see what I mean? Scientific creationism has to go way too far and twist themselves in knots to try to make it work. I do not believe the world is less than 10,000 years old. I do not believe that God made the world in six 24-hour days. People have very reasonably said God did not create the sun until I think it's day four. So how did you have three days of 24 hours before the sun was even created? And they come up with reasons for that. But why have to, why not God gives us the ability to perceive and the ability to think and he gives us evidence. We can't just discard all of that because of a particular literal, literalistic interpretation of what scripture says. I believe scripture is the word of God. I believe it is true. Do not misunderstand me. I'm not saying I don't believe that. But they interpret it in the wrong way. And when they thousand years. Exactly. Scripture itself says a day is as 10,000 years and 10,000 years a day. It says 10,000 in one place, 1,000 in the New Testament. And so the idea that this has to be a 24-hour day as we understand it, who said? And that segue brings us to the third <laughs> idea, which, in case you haven't figured it out by now, is the one I hold to. And that is called progressive creationism or day-age creationism. Now, one of the other things you need to understand, theistic evolutionists, scientific creationists, more so because it, they especially look at the other idea, the other theories, and say, you guys are stupid. Or else, you know, the scientific creationists would say, you don't really believe the word of God. You don't really believe in God. 
I mean, they're hypercritical of each other. They're not only after the, you know, the atheistic Darwinians, they're after each other. The one that is probably most lenient in terms of their evaluation of everything else is progressive or day-age creationism. Um, that's all there, it's just, you, you can't see the period. This approach is flexible regarding the creation timetable and chronology. It doesn't have to be six 24-hour days that God created the universe. It could be six periods of a thousand years or ten thousand years or a hundred thousand years or a million years. Because scripture is very clear in saying that to God a day is not what we think of as a day. And God was the only one who was around at that point. So for us to saddle him with our concept of what a day is doesn't seem to be necessary. But while it is flexible on the timetable and the chronology, progressive or day-age creationism, which is evangelical, meaning it is orthodox, it is takes seriously the word of God and the divinity of Jesus and all of that, it would say that absolutely we have to believe that God created everything ex nihilo. Ex nihilo means from nothing. See, a lot of people, even some theistic evolutionists, would say, well, there was something there, but it was just chaos, and then God reorganized it. No, we believe nothing existed other than God before God chose to create the universe. Secondly, that God made each species especially. He didn't start out with amino acids and then everything else sort of developed after that. God was very particular in making every species. While that does allow for microevolution, let me give you a definition. Microevolution means that a given species can have small changes that they go through. Um, I had a picture, actually I, I maybe should have brought that, I just now realized I had a presentation I did on this once before. Um, it's a picture of a Chihuahua and a Great Dane, you know, mm -hmm. and, the, and the Chihuahua is standing underneath the Great Dane looking up. They're both dogs, right? right. They are the same species. Mm -hmm. There is genetic, a predominant similarity in genetic makeup between a Chihuahua and a Great Dane or a Cocker Spaniel or a Malinois or whatever. And, and so we believe, and actually there's, there's such a thing as artificial selection, where people will breed certain characteristics. That's an example of microevolution, where they will intentionally breed certain animals together in order to create certain characteristics, right? You all know that. Dog breeds. One of the reasons that some dog breeds are really weird is because people did that to them by interbreeding in certain ways. And so microevolution is permissible. What's not permissible in, in this theory, or any theistic theory, I don't think, is macroevolution. Macroevolution, meaning big evolution, is sometimes referred to as speciation. The creation of new species from other species. For instance, the idea that if human beings were really evolved from other simian life forms, other species of mammals, great apes, for instance, then that's an, that would be an example of speciation or macro evolution. The technical word for it is called um, um, biogenesis, where new species get created. We have zero, we have zero examples of new species being created from other species. We have never found even one, and yet that is the fundamental, the foundational principle behind Darwinian evolution. We have no examples of that. We do have a lot of examples of micro evolution that can happen either by intent in terms of artificial selection where we make the decisions about who we're going to breed there's even an example of that in the bible you remember when jacob is working for his father-in-law laban and laban said um, you know laban wasn't a very nice guy to his brother his son-in-law and tricked him about his first wife and then he had to work 10 more years for the wife he really wanted and all that well in order to make himself wealthy laban agreed when Jacob said, can I have only the spotted animals? And Laban said, sure, I, there are hardly any spotted animals. And then what happened was, and this, is, this, this doesn't work according to biology, but it's the, it's the idea. You know, Jacob put the feed out so that when animals came up to eat the feed, the light was shining through the slats of their feeding troughs, and, it, and the, the, the light shining them on that way caused their children, their, their uh, the baby animals, to come out with more spots on them. So he ended up with a huge um, herd because of that. Well, 
we can't explain how the biological process worked there in terms of that's, that's not like breeding for characteristic, the idea of that, that happening because of sun. But there's a suggestion of the fact that even in scripture, it talks about the fact that you can target certain kinds of characteristics, right? That's micro evolution. You understand the difference? So, progressive or age creationism believed God made everything uh, from nothing. Every species was selected, was specifically uh, created, although it allows room for microevolution. When God created the dogs, we don't know what the first dogs looked like. We don't know if they were closer to a Great Dane or closer to a Chihuahua. But there have been, I mean, the German Shepherd dog, which I'm fascinated by, was only invented by crossbreeding in the late 1800s. Right? It hasn't existed longer than that. So there are examples of how that works. We know that. We also believe that there was time lapses between the various stages of creation. It wasn't 24 hours between let there be light and then the separation of the, of the waters and you know, the creation of dry land and the creation of the mammals that crawl on the face of the earth and the birds, etc. We don't believe that was just one day. We think there were long periods of time in between those. And those may have even varied because scripture itself says that God does not think of a day the way we think of as a day. And that's how we understand things developing. We believe that humans were created as they are, that they were not evolved. We were made in the image of God uniquely. We did not develop from lower animals. And that there was an original pair in which God said, I'm going to make man in my own image, male and female, I'm going to make him. Here they are. And that the fall really happened. That humanity was made for a relationship with God. That God trusted us and gave us the ability to make free choice because how can you have a love relationship with somebody if they don't have a choice in the matter? That would be being in love with a robot. God wanted us to, be, to choose him, to be in a relationship with him. So we violated that trust. And in the process, we broke our relationship with God. Sin and evil and pain and grief were introduced into the world. We believe that's real. So, I hold to the third. I believe it gives us the ability to say Scripture is real, it is true, without being so overly literal that we tie ourselves up in knots trying to prove that the world was made in six days, 24-hour days, and is only less than 10,000 years old. 6,684, I think I saw recently, is what some of them maintain. Questions about that? I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Yes? Okay, you made we'll say Adam and Eve in his image and and then there was the fall and they went out and they had two children, Cain and Abel, and they went out and found wives. So I was always wondering where did all those other people come from? Well, we're only told of their two sons. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say, and they had no other children. We're told yeah, about... Did they have all those children and then they intermarried? Well, the, some people have said, I don't have all the answers to that. I mean, there are still mysteries in here. Let's be, be clear. Yeah. Just a second. But... The, uh, it's widely understood that uh, geneticists would say earlier on, before there was as much watering down of the genetic material, that there was probably far less likelihood that intermarrying like brothers and sisters would have created a problem. In fact, earlier on in human societies, it was very common amongst royal families for brothers and sisters to marry. And early on, as the best records we have, they usually didn't have any problems with that. It was only when you get into later times when they had done it generation after generation after generation after generation in France and, and, and other parts of Europe especially, where they started coming out kind of gnarly, okay? <laughs> but prior to that, before, it, before that had happened a lot, there was no reason to believe that there was a genetic downside to that. I mean, some people have proposed also, and, I, and this is a mystery, I don't know, that it's possible that God may have created other being, you know, other women that could be serve as wives for the sons of, of Adam and Eve. All of that's possible. That doesn't any of those kinds of ideas don't affect the question, the idea that there was an original couple and they were given a relationship with God and they they violated that trust. Right. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I guess we aren't. It could be, I mean, that you had God created Adam and Eve to be his companions, even though he maybe had created 
people to cut with very fair created a number more than just two. They just weren't in relationship with God necessarily. Well, there's a, there's a suggestion, you know, there's a place, and people get really weird about this one, there's a place where it said the sons of men married the daughters, you know, of, daughters of who is it? Nephilim. What's that? The Nephilim. Well, the Nephilim come into the story. Uh, the sons of... Uh, giants. Well, there were giants in the land. But anyway, they talk about the fact that the sons of men married these daughters of somebody else. And I don't know why it just went out of my head. And people said, well, where did they come from? And um, the suggestion is, because this is down the line from Cain and Abel, that the, you know, the sons of God were the line of, um, basically, of Abel. They, they're the ones that had stayed seeking after God. And that there was a line that had chosen the direction that Cain went, and that is selfishness. And, and that so there was a time further down the line when some of those intermarried. There are huge mysteries in there. I'm not claiming that we figured out all of the details of the book of Genesis. My point is that, my point is almost exactly that. That there are things in there that we can't say we understand absolutely and have absolute theories for. And especially to say that somebody else is not really a Christian if they don't believe that the world is only 6,000 or 9,000 years old. Seems to me to be completely inappropriate and uncalled for. Did you have a. Yeah, uh, change the subject just a moment. Uh, do you have any uh, names of scientists that publish with this view of progressive or the age clear? Um, I would have to look up to find scientists. That would be very helpful. Most of the material I'm using today is from um, a guy named Doug Grutheis. G R O O. T-H-U-I-S. He's very good. But um, some of this stuff, uh, William Dembski, D-E-M-B-S-K-I, who's a mathematician and philosopher and theologian. Uh, I'm going to mention Michael Behe later, um, who wrote Darwin's Black Box. Um, Michael Denton, I mentioned already. All of these guys, from usually from a particular scientific orientation, because each of them has a particular discipline, have addressed these kinds of things. Uh, Grutheis gets into some detail on this, and he and I are in agreement that the progressive creationism makes a whole lot more sense, and you don't have to basically try to you know, talk yourself into something uh, that doesn't mean? make sense. Grutheis, G-R-O-O-T-H-U-I-S, Doug Grutheis. And if you get his book, uh, he's got a book called Christian Apologetics, colon, something, something. Um, you'll, you'll recognize some of the stuff I'm giving you today, because I, I, I stole a lot of this from him. Okay? Yes, Mike. Sorry. I was, I was going to comment that I have a background in genetics and, and, and biology, undergraduate uh, zoology. And He says there, he has a background in biology and zoology. He, she and, can't hear you. And what I was going to say was that there's been studies that have been done on extra nuclear uh, DNA uh, that, uh, that indicate that, the, that we had originally a mother that existed, all had a common mother, existed 150,000 years ago. It's called mitochondri mitochondrial DNA studies that have been mm -hmm. done. And mitochondri mitochondrial DNA mutates at a, at a known set rate and, and less rapidly than the, the nuclear DNA in the cell. Yep. And so they have a, a, they are able to track the time it takes for a certain evolution to occur or, or changes in the genetic material. And, and so they track back to a, to a common mother. Right. And, and that seems to confirm what, what's been said. Another theory would be that, that maybe Adam and Eve received the spirit. That they were, they were basically a lower form of creature and then God imbued them with humanity. That, that the act of creation was that he made them something different, even though they had existed as biological creatures before that. And that the evolution, the evolution of, of human beings, uh, the numbers of human beings that, that come, come uh, not evolution in the Darwinian right. sense, we, we became, eventually, everybody had a spirit. Yeah. And that's what eventually happened. Yeah, and it's possible. I don't think it's necessary. Um, but, okay, we're going to take a break. And by, and by the way, the idea that, well, maybe we had a common mother 150,000 years ago is not inconsistent with, uh, with progressive creationism because... Uh, recently, I think I mentioned earlier, I watched a video of a debate between um, Alistair McGrath and Christopher Hitchens. And Christopher Hitchens is up making his presentation and he looks down and apparently, I mean, we couldn't, I couldn't see it on the video, but he looks down and uh, Francis Collins 
the director of the Human Genome Project, who is a Christian, very, I mean, has as much renown and credibility and credentials as anybody, any scientist on the planet, Christopher Hitchens looks in the front row and sees Francis Collins sitting there, you know, when he's there saying people of faith are stupid. Well, at one point, sort of as a nod to the credibility of Francis Collins, Christopher Hitchens says, I'll give you that human beings have been around uh, 250,000 years. Then he looks at Francis Collins and says, is that okay with you? You agree with that? And Francis Collins says, more like 100,000 years. He goes, okay, I'll give 100,000 years if that's what you say. Um, because Francis Collins knows as much about human biology as the director of the genome, and it is genetic biology as anybody. So uh, the idea that the world has been, the, the universe was created 13 to 15 billion years ago, that the earth as we know it is considerably less than that, but that uh, God created, you know, so that there are long lapses in between things, but God did it, and he did it very intentionally, and then humanity as we know it was created somewhere between 100 and 250,000 years ago in terms of that's when the garden, if you will, occurred. Is, is that determined by the rate of division of the mitochondria? Is that what the I don't know what Francis Collins was basing it on. I mean, I've heard this issue before. I, we're going to need to take a break. I don't want to take a lot more questions right now. But uh, that's, that's possible. Uh, but he was basing it upon his own scientific expertise, and, and his, his particular expertise is in DNA. You know, it is in genetic materials. So. Okay, let's take a break. These are the ideas that Christians have proposed as to how they can sort of understand the development of life, the, you know, the, the creation and, and growth of life, especially of human life. So this is the Christian side. What about Darwinism? Unless you have taken specific courses on it and remember them, or unless you've studied it recently, I want to talk about um, an understanding of what Darwinism really says, and I'm going to give you the 10 cent version because it gets, it gets kind of complicated if you get into it. Um, actually, what Darwin wrote wasn't that complicated because Darwin had no knowledge of DNA or genes or RNA or how mutations occurred or anything else. Uh, he had no genetic knowledge or no knowledge of um, anything, of any microscopic world. So let's talk about what is Darwinism. The basic thing that Darwinism purports, I'm sorry, did I? There we go. Um, I had all this up at once. Uh, Darwinism is based upon the theory of natural selection, or to be more technical about it, descent with modification. Darwin's first major book was called um, The Origin of the Species, but then he wrote a second book called The Descent of Man. When he talks about descent, he means the sort of uh, evolutionary development from original ancestors down to what we have today. So descent of man means how we descended from predecessors. So descent with modification is the more technical expression that we usually call, what we usually call natural selection. That is the idea that, natu that nature favors organisms that evolve adaptively and reproduce abundantly. In other words, the stronger ones or the ones that, that are faster, stronger, have bigger teeth, you know, that, that, that's what it means by evolve adaptively and develop strengths that they, not, they live longer and they reproduce more often. Okay, the bigger lion has more little lions than the weak lion. Okay, that it judges that nature judges the unfit with sterility and death. Okay, that if... if if you're weak, you die out. If you're strong, you live and reproduce. That's what descent with modification means. If you add that the fittest survive and reproduce, and given enough time, this process of natural selection leads to the development of an entirely new species, which appear through a gradual process of incremental change. Okay? A new, uh, two baby lions are born. One of them is naturally bigger and has bigger teeth. One of them is smaller and has smaller teeth. Well, the smaller one dies, the bigger one reproduces. Well, he reproduces with a, a lioness who also has bigger teeth. So the babies they have have bigger teeth yet, or are faster, or whatever the characteristic is. And so the idea of these, these slight advantages, very slight advantages that a, that a, a, a biological creature has, those advantages help them live longer, reproduce more, and they pass those advantages on. And then those advantages increase a little bit each time. My small, small increments of improvement over time. 
So the descent means down through generation after generation after generation, there are modifications. That's why it's called descent with modification. Now, the only things that get passed on, according to Darwinian descent with modification, are the characteristics that give an advantage. Right? Only the ones that make you faster, stronger, smarter, etc. But that's, that's what gets passed on. Because if you, you know, if, if you don't have better adaptive characteristics, then you die off. Or, you know, the potential mates out there don't want to have anything to do with you because they like the, te the lion with the big teeth, or whatever it is, you see. Now, that was Darwin's original idea, in a nutshell. That's the, the five cent version of it. Later on, because Darwin, as I said, did not know anything about genetics, he didn't know anything about the microscopic world, he did not know how characteristics actually got passed on, he just based upon, he was a naturalist. And he spent five years on a voyage on the, the ship, the Beagle, as the naturalist. And he visited the Galapagos Islands and various other places, quite famously. And so from his travels and what he witnessed, and he was a very good observer, and he was very good at writing down what he observed, and then the conclusions he drew from it, was that creatures, over a period of time, adapt and as they go along, they adapt more positive, minor changes, and those changes accumulate to create better creatures, and eventually they become a whole new species. All right, you got that. It makes sense. Now, the fact that he was not a geneticist, he didn't understand gene genetics, at the same time that he was alive, there was another guy alive who happened to be a monk in Europe. Darwin was English. Uh, Gregor Mendel was German. Gregor Mendel was a monk who grew plants. That was his job as a monk. And he specifically was interested in, in certain plants like sweet peas. And he recognized certain positive characteristics among different kinds of plants. Well, as a monk, he didn't have a whole lot of other demands on his time. And so he was meticulous in, in writing down, capturing the characteristic of these different plants, and then cross-pollinating them himself and then looking at what kind of plants came out of that, sweet peas being one of the primary ones. He actually is the first one ever to figure out that there are characteristics from, from the mama plant and the papa plant, and they come together and create a particular kind of baby plant. Gregor Mendel is the one that figured out how characteristics, including dominant characteristics and recessive characteristics, you've heard of that. Gregor Mendel, who lived at the same time, is the one who figured that out. Gregor Mendel actually read some of the early published stuff that, that uh, Darwin had written, because he was interested in science, and he said, I don't agree with him, but I know how that works. Mendel's the one who figured all that out. He is the father of modern genetics. He was not, most distinctly, not a Darwinist. He thought Darwin's idea of speciation, that species developed because of this and he understood the process a lot better than Darwin ever did. Um, well, if you take Darwin's original idea of natural selection or descent with modification, and you add to it the genetic discoveries that started with Gregor Mendel and since and developed after that, the neo-Darwinists that came along later on, a generation and, and more later, they created what's called the neo-Darwinian synthesis, with basics of Darwin's idea plus an addition of how does genetics work. That is the thing that is dominant in terms of the scientific view of, of genetics today, or Dar of Darwinian uh, evolution today. So, Gregor Mendel and others sort of explained how the process worked and filled in all of the giant gaps that were in Darwin's theory. Even though some of the best of those, including Mendel, did not agree with Darwin's conclusions. Yes? Was Darwin a Christian? No, absolutely not. In fact, Darwin actually said he didn't believe he could believe what he believed, you know, his theories, and believe in a God. So he, he, did, did, he did not believe in God. Darwin, people are always saying things like Darwin was a Christian, or he converted on his deathbed, or Einstein was a Christian. Neither of those things are true. You know, we don't do ourselves any justice when we, you know, when we pass on things like that. And neither one of them had any faith. So yes. just to clarify, prior to his observations, he was not a, a, a man of God. He was um, not religious. Person. Everybody was religious at that point. Yeah. Up to, you know, everybody started out as church people. In fact, there was a point, I believe, in Darwin's 
early age when he considered going into the priesthood, and he was, and that was the intention, you know, in, into the ministry, you know, priesthood being Anglican uh -huh. in the Church of England. Uh, but he uh, loved science and loved naturalism, and so he signed on as a naturalist on this voyage because he had some gifts at it and was recommended for it. And then when he actually developed his theories of evolution, he said, I don't believe there is a designer God. mutually exclusive. Thing. Yeah, exactly. Okay. 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 Um, there are other pieces that the Neo-Darwinians came up with, things like genetic drift, you know, which cause uh, another way genetic variation occurs, etc. But this bo uh, bottom line, this is what Darwinianism is. That all of it happens by accident. Mm -hmm. And that all creatures are descended from previous creatures. And in some cases, these big jumps were made from one species to another. Again, it's called speciation or a biogenesis. Yes? So, if Gregor Mendel was working with sweet peas and, you know, a red one and a white one and made a pink one, but it, they all stayed sweet peas. It didn't all of a sudden end up with a rose out of it. That's why he didn't believe, Gregor Mendel did not believe speciation was the right conclusion. Uh, and actually, what he, what he determined was, you take a red sweet pea and a, you know, and a white sweet pea and you cross them and he came up with the formulas that said out of that you might get one pink sweet pea but the likelihood is you will get the dominant gene will show up as, you know, if you have multiple plants, three of the five will be uh, red, if red is the dominant trait, I don't remember mm -hmm. the, the colors. Yeah. One of them will be white because that's the recessive and one may be a mutation that's a cross between the two and it might be pink. And Gregor Mendel worked on this for years and years and years, very carefully cross-pollinating and cross-breeding these things in order to be able to determine that. And that's how he came up with the understanding that there are dominant genes, those that will, in the majority of cases, will show, will show up in the descendants. There are recessive genes that will show up but less often, and then it's possible to have mutations. Well, one of the things Gregor Mendel demonstrated, and that others have proven since then, is that mutations almost always, in almost every case, a mutation is fatal. That when you cross things, and you develop a mutation, mutation is almost always self-destructive genetically. Um, which is an absolute direct violation of what Darwin proposed. Yes? One of the things that's kind of interesting is that dogs have been bred, bred by humans for 10,000 years, they estimate and that, that they've yet to create a new species of dogs. Yeah. Well, it, it, not a new species, exactly. We come up with different flavors, but it's still a dog. It's still a dog. Okay, no matter how hard we try. Uh, I'm gonna quote uh, Luther Burbank here in a minute. But yeah, that, this, the, I, this huge jump to speciation, a biogenesis, is the thing that Gregor Mendel and, and so many others are saying, there is no evidence for that. And Darwin said, um, the evidence is out there, we just haven't found it yet. We actually have fewer possible examples of speciation now than they had in Darwin's time. Because some of the things that they proposed that might be examples of speciation, like the development of a horse as a unique creature in North America, uh, they used to think there's an example that came from other kinds, tapers and other kinds of animals, and it developed into a horse, a new species. Well, now they've proven that didn't happen. That wasn't so. And we have fewer examples that might be examples of speciation now than they had in Darwin's day. Yes? Well, they have the horse and the mule. I mean, the horse and the donkey makes a mule, but generally the mule is sterile. Not generally. Always. It's always sterile. Always sterile. It's always sterile. Mules are always sterile. There's an example where when we, when we cross two species, a mule, and, a mule and a horse, or I'm sorry, a donkey and a horse are two different species. They're close enough that they can interbreed. But, again, when the two species interbreed, they create a mutation. A mule is always a mutated form. It's neither one of those two. And yet it's not a whole new species. At least it's not a reproducible species because every mule is sterile. Yeah. Oh. One of the problems that they have in supporting Dar Darwinian theory is that during the Cambrian period, uh, there was an explosion. You're getting ahead of me. And, and uh, okay. okay. No. Uh, yeah, to finish that up, there's a period of time um, called the Cambrian Explosion, or what's called the Big Bang of Biology, in which, again, Darwin said, when we find all the fossils that we need, it'll prove the descent, you know, to, to current species, etc. Well, there are problems with that. The Cambrian Explosion, the vast majority of, of uh, animal forms that exist in the world today, 
they didn't develop over a long period of time. They happened almost all at once over a, period, a relatively short period of time called the Cambrian Explosion. And there are no predecessors to those. We have fossil evidence that they just appeared out of nowhere. And the Darwinian biologists have always said, well, eventually we'll find them. Well, now, paleontologists or others saying, if we were going to find any evidence at all, we would have found it by now. We have none. And so they have to try to come up with excuses. Like, well, all the precursor forms to what we do have in, you know, evidence of, they were all soft-bodied, and so they didn't fossilize. We got a bazillion other kinds of soft body from earlier than the Cambrian explosion. Lots of soft body creatures that were, were fossilized. So that does, you know, so much of that doesn't wash. The, the whole idea of ev transformative evolution, which is what Darwin said would happen, doesn't work. Yes? Uh, do you know whether or not ligers are sterile, you know, cross what? between lines and tigers? I don't know. Like I say, I'm not an evolutionary biologist. I sort of feel like when I was on the last cruise, the, um, the, cru the cruise that Carol and I, the last two cruises we did were Wonders of Arabia, where we went around Arabia. Well, the first time we went, we had an Egyptologist on board, um, Emily Teeter, and she and I shared the lectures. Well, the second time, I, was, did, I did all the lectures. I did 18 lectures um, on the cruise, 18-day cruise. And the first people I met, like the first three couples we met, and when they, they said, oh, you're the, I said, I'm the speaker, and they said, oh, you're the, the Egyptologist. I went, I'm not an Egyptologist. And we made that joke. I said, I need to get a t-shirt that says, I am not an Egyptologist. Now, I did some lectures on Egypt, you know, but um, I need a t-shirt now that says, I'm not an evolutionary biologist. I don't claim a special expertise in this. I'm a theologian and a philosophical theologian. So. So that, we're, I'm going to get into some more specifics of this. We may be here for a few hours. Um, but this is what Darwin says. And I saw, earlier I told you how Christians try to explain that. And now I want to give you something which to me is just astonishing. The suggestion which I mentioned earlier that scientists, including atheistic Darwinian scientists, would say that science is unbiased, that we follow the evidence where it takes us. Unlike religious people, we are not people of faith. We are people who entirely rely on the evidence for us. I want to give you a quote from a very renowned Darwinian biologist whose name is Richard Levantine. And, wait a minute, did I miss something? Oh no, this is it. An unwavering commitment to materialism. See, one of the basic flaws of Darwinism is that they start out with the presumption that there can't be anything other than the physical world. That's their, that's their a priori, to use the philosophical term, meaning their a priori assumption. A priori means before anything else. Before anything else, they have the assumption that the physical world is all that exists. There are no souls, there are no angels, there is no God. And that's absolutely necessary. And if you don't believe it, here's a quote from uh, Richard Lewontine. He says, We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori, and his, before everything else, our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is an absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. That sounds like faith to me. <laughs> Do you hear this? And he's not the only one. A lot of scientists, who at least were a little bit more self-aware, said, no, we start out with the a priori belief that there is nothing that's not the material world, and, and come hell or high water, no matter what the evidence says, we are not going to change that idea. That's what he's saying. He talks about absurd constructs, unsubstantiated just-so stories, and yet they will not allow any suggestion that a materialistic, atheistic worldview is not accurate. Is that, does that dumbfound you as much as it does me? <laughs> and this is not, it's not just this guy. This is, this is quite common. The suggestion, I mentioned, I quoted Theodore Do, uh, Dobansky earlier that said, nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution. 
Well, that's wrong. Because there was a whole lot of science being done before Darwin came along. You know, we had anatomy, botany, microbiology, uh, systematic studies, embryology. All of those things were founded and flourishing before Darwin's theory was ever proposed. The suggestion that all biological study fails or cannot be done in the absence of Darwinian evolution is hooey. It simply can't, it is not true. A lot of scientists in those fields who are not religious have rejected Darwinian theory because, unlike Richard Leventine, they are prepared to follow the evidence where it goes. Uh, embryologist Carl Ernst von Bayer, uh, biologist Richard Owen, Gregor Mendel that I mentioned, chemist Philip Skell. Philip Skell is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, and he said that when he, he's, he's a, um, a biochemist, he said that when he considered the major biological discoveries of the 20th century, he, and I quote here, found that Darwin's theory had provided no discernible guidance but was brought in after the breakthroughs as an interesting narrative gloss. Gloss is sort of a, you know, a polish that you put on something to make it look better. So this suggestion that science is unbiased, that it follows the evidence where it leads, is simply not how it gets practiced. It is full of propaganda. It is full of, I'm not going to change my mind. I don't care what the evidence says. Now, um, it is not a neutral strategy. I'm having to skip some stuff here. Um, in fact, a scientist in, in Darwin's day named Richard Midfart, who was a professor of biology, lived in when Dar and Darwin did. Even then, he said that Darwin presupposed naturalism in order to explain away any religious realities. In other words, he had a reason for it. He wanted to find an excuse for not believing in God and that that was one of his motivations. But the suggestion that Darwinism has to be true because naturalism has to be true, no matter what the evidence tells us. G.K. Chesterton, one of my great heroes, as some of you know. Um, Chesterton, one of the smartest men that ever lived, I believe. Um, George Bernard Shaw, who was his friend, but constant, you know, they, they disagreed on everything. Uh, Shaw, was, they were close friends. Shaw was an atheist, a uh, vegetarian, a uh, teetotaler, a humanist. Chesterton, at his worst, weighed almost 400 pounds, not because he was glutton, but because he just didn't pay attention to that sort of thing. He loved beer and, and, and uh, wine. He, you know, he was a theologian, believed in God, etc. Um, and yet, when Chesterton died, uh, well, before he died, Bernard Shaw said, the world is not grateful enough for Gilbert Chesterton. And when he died, even though they disagreed on everything and they debated publicly on everything, um, Shaw offered to support Chesterton's wife. I mean, I just give you that as a little tidbit. Chesterton pointed out that Christians, unlike atheists or particularly naturalists, do not have to be committed to this completely inflexible, static kind of perception about things. We can admit that we don't know everything. We can admit that there may be theories that don't fit into our understanding. But not so with the biologist. When Leventine said we cannot allow a divine foot in the door, he means if we give in anything, if we make any concession to the supernatural, then everything we have falls apart. Chesterton said this, The Christian is quite free to believe that there is a considerable amount of settled order and inevitable development in the universe. In other words, we can recognize there are processes that go on and that, that there is microevolution, you know, which I said earlier, and, and various other things. But the materialist is not allowed to admit into his spotless machine the slightest speck of spiritualism or miracle. They cannot allow the divine foot in the door or everything they believe falls apart. I'm perfectly happy to be able to say there's some stuff I don't understand. There's some things I don't know how they fit in. And that doesn't do anything to damage my system of beliefs. They can't do that. And I think there's a, great, a really strong ring of truth or falsehood, depending upon what we're able to do in that regard. Some people have proposed that there, were, uh, there are a number of icons of evolution. And here I'm going to refer to some things that you all probably were taught, or that you've seen in science books, as evidence of evolution. And you may not remember them until I point them out, but then you will. And I'm going to do this pretty quickly, because we've only got about 22 more minutes. Um, first, the color of moths. You've probably seen the photographs in England, in Manchester, England. This is sort of the poster, you know, these peppered moths, they're called, have become sort of the poster children of the evolutionary movement. 
because the pictures are, what happened during the Industrial Revolution um, is that 90% of the moths around Manchester, England, a very industrial city, where they used to be lighter colored, all of a sudden they became darker in color. And the evolutionary biologist said this is an example. What happened was the pollution from the Industrial Revolution made all of the trees have soot on them, so they were dark. And when the moths landed on these trees, the light colored moths were more visible on the dark trees from, that were darkened by pollution. And so the birds ate them, but the darker moths were harder to see, and so more of them lived. And the darker moths then had other baby moths that were darker, who had moths that were darker, etc. And this was considered specific example proof of evolutionary biology. All right? Well, there are a few problems. That was, I mean, I've seen the pictures in the textbooks. Have you guys seen them? Of the moths on the tree trunks? Okay. Up until the 1980s, this was held to be absolutely true, but then they started discovering some discrepancies. For instance, they discovered that darker moths did not replace lighter moths in the areas that were the most polluted. So this didn't work everywhere. In fact, it didn't work in the places where it should have worked the most. They also identified that in rural areas of England, where there wasn't pollution, there was a higher frequency of darker moths than lighter moths. The pollution couldn't have caused it, and therefore it was not something that led to predation, that, that lighter moths were being eaten. That didn't cause it. And then, later on, when pollution decreased in the city of London, and the tree trunks started getting lighter again, there was an increase of the number of darker moths in one part of London and a decrease in the number of darker moths in another part of London, even though all of them had the same situation. Worse yet, for the evolutionary biologist, moths, pepper moths, don't land on tree trunks. The photographs that were famous, that were taken, and I have seen them, I remember them, those moths were placed by hand on those tree trunks in order to take photographs. Moths do not land on the flat surface of a, of a tree bark. And yet, and so the whole thing was a setup. I'm sure that the people who did it thought they were, they discovered something and they were just trying to prove it. But none of the evidence, and this is considered one of the strongest examples we have of an evolutionary process, although a micro-evolutionary process. It is not that they came up with a new species because these darker moths lived. Another example are the finch beak variations. One of the things that uh, is famous and is considered evolution in action is when Charles Darwin was on the HMS Beagle, the ship, and they visited the Galapagos Islands, he apparently witnessed that there were different, in different islands, there were different kinds of finches, and these have become known as Darwin's finches, by the way, and they had different kinds of beaks. The ones where they lived, where they had to reach down into a um, trees and stuff to get seeds had long beaks. The ones who had really heavy seeds they had to crack open had heavy beaks. And he identified that as being an example of evolutionary variation, that they had evolved according to their circumstance. Well, there's several problems with that. One, Darwin never mentions them in the origin of the species. In fact, there's almost just barely a mention of them at all in the notes because we have them from his natural voyage with the uh, naturalist voyage with the beagle. In addition to that, in the 1970s, a, a research team under Peter and Rosemary Grant went to the Galapagos. And in 1977, there was a big drought. And during that drought, there was a significant reduction in the seeds that the finches had to eat. And they, they witnessed that, about, um, that, that the finches, because of a lack of food, because of the drought, died off. 85% of them died off. There was only 15% of the finches left. And the ones that survived tended to have larger bodies and larger beaks. Well, they thought, wow, we have just witnessed, in a matter of just a year or so, an example of evolutionary development. The finches that lived, the finches that lived had bigger beaks and bigger bodies. The others died off. That all sounded great. In fact, they said that given the cycle of drought and, you know, that occurs in the Galapagos, they believed that, a, that they could even see a, a whole new species transform within 200 years because it was so short a time that they saw this change happen. Well, usually, evolutionary biologists talk in tens of thousands of years before you see any, any major changes. Well, there's a problem, though. What they discovered is that after, this was all found in 1979, in 1982 and 1983, El Nino, 
caused there to be a lot of rain and a lot of growth and a lot more food available. Finch food became very plentiful. And according to evolutionary biology, that would mean you have a whole lot more finches that have the bigger beaks, right? Because that's what was left. What they actually discovered is what they call the principle now of oscillation. That when more finches were born and there was more food for them, they regressed back to the old way where their beaks weren't so heavy. And the thing that they determined, which the evolutionary biologists don't write about, but others have, is that it appears that evolutionary mechanisms don't go consistently in one direction. They tend to oscillate. They'll regress. They'll go backwards. Just because one thing has developed doesn't mean it's going to continue like that. And we have evidence of that in the Galapagos. And in fact, long periods of time, rather than saying it's going to prove a progression of evolution, we have evidence now that it will, it will show a progression of both evolution and de-evolution. And so the idea of progressing to the point where a whole new species is created is contrary to modern scientific evidence. So that don't make sense? I'm not losing you guys, am I? Okay, evolutionary extrapolation run amok. Um, there is really scant evidence of there being um, of there being significant examples of progressive microevolution. There is no example that we have of macroevolution. Hi, everybody. Sorry. If you need to ride somewhere, I can take you. Seriously? Yeah, rather than leave. <laughs> Okay, um, so one of the things is the evolutionary biologist, Darwin starting and everybody after him, they see evidence and they say, okay, this takes tens of thousands, maybe 100,000 years for evolution to really work and develop species especially. But they extrapolate from what they experienced in a short period of time, just like this couple did when they saw the finches in 1979. And they assumed, they extrapolated that in 200 years, we could have a whole new species if this keeps going. Well, um, Norman Macbeth, scientist, who's not a Darwinian, said, extrapolation is a dangerous procedure. Extrapolation is where you see something and then you, you project what it's going to be in the future. That's to extrapolate from it. Extrapolation is a dangerous procedure. If you observe the growth of a baby during its first months, extrapolation into the future will show that that child will be eight feet tall when six years old. Therefore, all statisticians recommend caution in extrapolation. Darwin, however, plunged in with no caution at all. And Darwinian since him have done the same. They see a very small thing, and then they extrapolate to these grand conclusions. Like I say, you watch a baby grow for six months, and you'll think that by six years, he's going to be eight feet tall. Extrapolation frequently does not work. And yet, they do it all the time. Now, I mentioned Luther Bay for Burbank earlier. Luther Burbank lived from 1849 to 1926. You guys remember Luther Burbank? He is considered the, the uh, greatest plant breeder and in that regard, geneticist that has ever lived. He created the Idaho potato. That's how important he was. I mean, what we know of as an Idaho potato. He took various other species and cross-pollinated you know, cross them to come up with what we know of as this big, fat, luscious, healthy potato. Um, yeah, and he, he's responsible for creating 800 documented new plants, meaning not whole new species, but versions of things. Um, Luther Burbank knew something about the way, the way that genetics works. He said that all species have a proclivity to straight, stay true to their type. They don't change that much. In fact, he quoted what's called the law of reversion to the average. Law of reversion to the average. That's what they saw in the, in, when rain came back to the Galapagos, when the, the finches went back to their old beaks. The law of reversion of the average says that all living things will keep within a more or less, less fixed set of limitations. They don't change that much. There is a natural tendency to go back to the way they were before, even when you have mutations. And Burbank said this was even true during plant breeding by design. Even if you are trying to force it in a certain direction, it's going to fight you to go back to the way it was before. How much more likely in chance, that is natural selection, is that law going to be true? And again, Luther Burbank knew about as much about how you grow new plants, etc., as anybody ever has. Um, there's also, say it with me, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. <laughs> you guys remember that from bio biology? 
Yep, I do. What is that? Well, um, ontogeny is the development of embryos in vertebrate animals, animals that have backbones. Uh, so they, you know, when a, when a baby is conceived in its mother's womb and it's still an embryo, that's ontogeny. Phylogeny is the development of life from one species to another. It's another word for a biogenesis. You know, that's, that means species, it goes from one species to another. So, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, says that every embryo of a vertebrate, an animal with a backbone, will, at, during its development as an embryo, go through a series of stages, and at each stage it will reflect some prior species that it evolved from. What they used to say, it was called the biogenic law, was that a human embryo goes through stages where at first it looks like a one-celled marine organism, and then it looks like a worm, and then it looks like a fish, and then it looks like an amphibious creature, and then it looks like a mammal, and then it becomes a human. That through the process of the embryo developing, it goes through the stages of all the various creatures that it descended from. From a one-celled organism down through primate mammal to human. You won't read that in new books because it has com been completely discounted, but people still quote it. They will, you know, and they'll show you the pictures and they'll say, you know, the drawings. Ern uh, Ernest Hinkel was a German in the, eight he lived from the first third of the 1800s to the 1919. And Hankel believed this, and he had a whole series of drawings, and these drawings are frequently, you know, they were the most common thing that were used in biology texts to, to teach this. And he had drawings that showed that human beings went from one of these ancient creatures that they'd been descended from to another until they became human. The problem is, these aren't used anymore because the, the law, biogenic law has been completely discounted, and it's been determined that Henkel only included the classes and orders of embryos that fit his theory and left all the others out. He distorted the embryos in his drawings. They're not photographs, they're drawings, because back then, you, you know, taking photographs of embryos was not as easy. Um, and he intentionally altered them to be what he wanted them to be. And he admitted some of the stages that didn't fit in his theory. In other words, this whole thing, he created it in order to fit what he thought would be. So this whole ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny has been completely discounted. It is not science anymore. And yet you'll still hear it quoted that, well, the embryo of a human shows that we're descended from all these other kinds of creatures. Not true. Okay. We have Darwin's tree of life. Darwin said that the fossil record would eventually show that all creatures developed and that they, it, the tree of life would split, you know, and that lizards would become birds and birds would be, you know, and then all of this kind of thing. It simply is not true that that has been demonstrated. Darwin his whole shtick when he was alive was, well, we haven't gotten very far in, um, in archaeology, well, not archaeology, paleontology, digging up bones, and, but when we progress in that field, it will provide all the evidence we need to prove that the tree of life from single-celled animals down to, you know, to uh, larger aquatic animals, to lizards, to then birds in one direction and mammals in another, and then higher forms of mammals and humans. We'll find all those in between. We refer to the human, the last of the human links between lar the larger primates, great apes, and us, the missing link, right? You all know that expression. You all have probably read about the Piltdown Man and various other times when they thought they had found the missing link. A lot of those were hoaxes or else they were determined, in fact, all of them have either been hoaxes or they, they determined that it was a misunderstanding of the, uh, the paleontological record, that it actually was not the, an in intermediate, but it was a Neanderthal, which was not, and Neanderthal was a different species from a Homo sapien, a Homo neanderthalus, or they determined that it actually was an ape. They have never found any link between one species and another ever. There is no paleontological or biological evidence for transition from species to species or speciation. All right? And particularly the Cambrian explosion that we talked about earlier, this biology's Big Bang, the idea is they found all these fossils of all these creatures that seem to just appear out of nowhere during the Cambrian explosion, which is five to six hundred million years ago. Um, and 
yet there's no precursors to them. They seem to have just shown up. In fact, that is so unusual and so much contrary to Darwinian evolution, descent by, um, you know, descent by natural selection, that some of the very best scientists in the last 60 years or so have, tried to, have had to come up with other theories. One of the best and most popular of the biological sciences, scientists, Stephen Jay Gould, came up with a completely different theory because of the Cambrian uh, evidence from the Cambrian explosion. He proposed a thing called punctuated equilibrium, sometimes called saltation. And punctuated equilibrium says that evolution is not a constant progress, that it jumps forward in big spurts. And we don't know why. But it's not the Darwinian idea of a constant slow progression with slow you know, adva advantages being presented as we go along. Um, some scientists, like Francis Crick, who was one of the co-founders of the DNA helix, you know, the, the, uh, Francis Crick's belief that the reason that all of that happened and where people came from was because um, aliens put us here. Aliens? Aliens. Okay. He's a pretty significant scientist. But I say, I tell you that because that's an example that the evidence is so contrary when you really look at it to what Darwinian natural selection, you know, this descent by modification, says it should be that scientists, Stephen Jay Gould, Francis Crick, both very significant scientists, have had to come up with other theories. Now, even people can't poo-poo them as being sci scientists, but they simply look the other way when their theory is mentioned. They've never really caught on. Okay. Um, I may have to pick this up next week. And we may have to pick some of this up next week because I'm running out of time and I've got more I want to tell you. Pump the transitional forms, the idea again of why we can't find something that transitions from one species to the other. The one that everyone refers to, that everyone says is the example, is the, um, the Archaeopteryx, which is supposedly they have a fossil that supposedly shows that there is a transition between um, lizards and birds because it has some features that look like lizard and some that look like birds. The bones appear to be the bones of a bird, but it's got claws. It has wings, but it has a breastbone that doesn't look like it can support wings. And so it is, there's one fossil, and I read an account one time that the guy who discovered it was really trying to make money off of it, and they think it may have been a hoax, but they've never been able to prove that. Well. Very quickly, the bone and feather, and, and you know, Christopher Hitchens, for instance, makes a big deal out, out of the Archaeopteryx. He says it is proof of speciation. Well, the reason that not everybody will say that is because one, the bone and feather arrangements that on the Archaeopteryx that they say proves it's a transition between lizards and birds are exactly the same as present-day swans. Yeah. The um, claws on its wings, which are not consistent with birds. You've seen pterodactyl, you know, you watch the movies. They've got claws because they were lizards that flew. Well, birds don't have that, except there is a bird in South America called the Watson that does have claws on its wings. Um, modern birds don't have teeth, but we have other fossils that say that some ancient birds did. You know, birds have beaks, lizards have teeth. Well, we have other creatures in the, in the paleontological record that did have teeth, and they were birds. It's argued that their shallow breastbone would not make it capable of flying. And so it was a transition between lizards and birds. It hadn't developed the bone structure it needed to fly yet. Well, the fact is that I mentioned Watson, a bird from South America. It's got a breastbone exactly like the Archaeopteryx. And it can fly. Not well, but it flies. And who says a bird has to fly? Ostriches don't fly. Penguins don't fly. It could just be a bird. Um, the Archaeopteryx birds were once thought to be solid like a reptiles, but now estimates as they examine much more closely the, the fossil record, it seems to be, or that fossil, they've only got one, it seemed to be that they likely were hollow like a bird's. Um, it's, recent discoveries have indicated that uh, bird fossils have been found, not the Archaeopteryx, but have been found from the same period, which are very similar. So all of the supposed absolutely conclusive evidence, according to Dawkins and especially Christopher Hitchens, that this is a transitional form between lizard and bird, we got all sorts of other examples that said it doesn't have to be that, that it's easily explained. 
The idea of a, a, a common human ancestor, I already mentioned that we have never found the missing link. We have no, nothing that proves to us. And they say, well, we share a significant amount of DNA with the, primary, the primates. Well, God could have done that, right? The assumption that because there's a similarity, that's just like they say, well, if you look at the bones of a whale's fin, and you look at the bones in, a, in certain birds' feet, and you look at the bones in the human hand, clearly they're the same. And so that, and that's a proof of us being descended. Well, maybe God decided this is the right design, and I'm going to use it in more than one place. Is there any reason that's not possible? The similarity between those things in different species does not mean that it necessarily has to be an issue of descent. It could be simultaneously intended design of multiple creatures with similar characteristics. There is nothing to argue against that. Um, that's, that's really the issue of homology. Homology is when we have different features in different creatures that, have, that serve different functions but look alike. Um, we also have vestigial organs and systems. You probably heard that one. Well, the appendix is a sign of when we were, before we evolved into humans, the coccyx, the tail ball, is a sign, uh, you know, these serve no purpose. Well, in, 19, in 1895, um, Ernst Wiedersheim published a list of 86, by, by grace, of 86 different vestigial organs in the human body. 86 different characteristics we have that have no purpose and so therefore we're assumed to be a carryover from a previous earlier evolutionary form that we, we developed out of. The thing is they have now determined that the human coccyx or tailbone is a crucial point of contact with the muscles that are attached to the pelvic floor. We need it. They determined that um, well, one after another, they have been able to determine that so many of these things that they thought were just useless vestigial, meaning, you know, leftover, organs actually have a purpose. In fact, some of the scientists have said that we have junk DNA. I'm almost finished. We have junk DNA, which has no purpose. That, you know, and uh, Richard Dawkins has made a big deal out of that, that this junk DNA, he's even said, you know, what kind of God would put DNA in that has no purpose? Well, now they determine that there actually is a genetic reason for junk DNA, that it carries particular kind of characteristics, while not as finely defined, that there are reasons for it to be there. And so a lot of scientists are now saying, go down the list of vestigial organs, including junk DNA, and it's like every year we find something else that tells us we needed that, that it's not just left over from somewhere else. So the point in all of this is that based upon Many of the things, these are some of the primary arguments that are made for Darwinian evolution, and yet there are very legitimate scientific responses to them. And it opens the door for the idea, I believe, that there was a designer, that we are not the way we are by accident or by long-term development from previous forms of creatures, but we are what God intended us to be. Okay? I'm going to pick this up next week, and we'll talk about irreducible complexity, etc. before we get into the next topic. Any questions? It's 3 o'clock already. Any questions about that? Has this been useful to you in terms of at least getting a sense? I don't expect any of you to be evolutionary biologists, but I at least want you to have a sense that it ain't as simple as they would tell you. Yes? I heard somewhere, I can't remember where, the Darwin at the end of his life was even starting to doubt his, his front. Is that correct? Did I don't know. That? It's possible. Yeah, I'm not an evolutionary biologist. I'm also not an expert on Darwin, but uh, I mean, I know something about him, but I, I don't know. It's very possible. I, I think the closer we get to the final conclusion, the more seriously we take issues of faith. That's why there are no, there are no uh, atheists in the foxholes, as they say. So. Thank you, folks. I will pick up some more of this. The interesting parts of like irreducible complexity, some of the modern biological findings of Michael Behe and others next week. Wow. Thanks for being here. Thank you.